Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, what we do on Fortunate Ends is talk about a series of different things, including executions, crime, and mystery. So if you're into all that, be sure to subscribe as I upload it every single Friday. Anyway, let's get into the video. Michael Rockefeller was a member of the esteemed Rockefeller family, one of America's great business and political dynasties. Growing up in New York in the 1940s and 1950s, he would have wanted for nothing. But in 1961, he vanished in the wilds of New Guinea in the East Indies region of the South Pacific. But who was Michael Rockefeller and what exactly happened to him? Michael Clark Rockefeller was born on the 19th of May 1938. He and his twin sister Mary were the youngest children of Nelson A. Rockefeller and Mary Rockefeller. Michael's middle name Clark came from his maternal grandfather Mary's maiden name having been Clark. The twins had three elder siblings, Rodman, Anne and Stephen Rockefeller, having been born in quick succession between 1932 and 1936. The Rockefellers were, and indeed continue to be, one of the most significant dynasties in American political, business and public life. The family's ascent occurred under John D. Rockefeller during the 19th century, who had made his first fortune through the American oil boom, eventually forming Standard Oil, at one time the world's largest oil company, and then diversifying into other fields, such as the railway boom of the 1870s and 1880s. His son John D. Rockefeller Jr. subsequently concentrated much of the family's power in New York City as real estate magnates, and his successes branched out into many different fields including politics. For instance, one of Rockefeller Jr.'s grandsons, Nelson Rockefeller, who was Michael Rockefeller's father, entered politics serving as governor of New York State from 1959 through to 1973, and then as vice president of the United States when Gerald Ford succeeded Richard Nixon in 1974. During the time of Nelson's political ascent, the wider Rockefeller family also became known countrywide and even internationally as prominent philanthropists as well as business people. For instance, throughout these years, they continued to provide lavish endowments and donations to many educational, artistic and cultural institutions. It is perhaps then unsurprising to find out that Michael Rockefeller was drawn to cultural studies, a field to which the Rockefeller family had shown such an affinity for decades by the time Michael reached his late teens having been educated at the prestigious Buckley School on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in the 1950s, Michael subsequently attended the Phillips Exeter Academy Boarding School in New Hampshire before heading to Harvard. Although his family had certainly provided enough donations to the Massachusetts University over the years to have strings to pull, Michael's intelligence and academic achievement meant that even without this he earned his place at the Ivy League College and soon graduated cum laude with a BA in History and Economics. However, a hefty dose of nepotism was most certainly involved in Michael's next move. In 1957, his father had provided a grant towards and opened the new Museum of Primitive Art in New York City, the first such institution to be set up in the United States, dedicated to showcasing the artistic work of primitive tribes and cultures from Asia, Africa, Oceania and elsewhere. Thanks to Nelson's patronage of the new museum, when Michael graduated from Harvard, he was already listed as a trustee of the museum, and it was in this capacity that he was selected to take part in an expedition organised by the museum to New Guinea in the far out reaches of the East Indies in 1960. Yet, what at first seemed to be an exciting trip to a remote part of the world turned out to be anything but. The island young Rockefeller was heading to was one of the most isolated areas of the entire South Pacific. Papa is the largest island in modern day Indonesia, but despite its size, it was historically one of the most obscure and least settled on account of its remoteness from the more affluent regions of the East Indies on the Manay Peninsula and the surrounding islands such as Java and Borneo. These regions had been highly praised for their spice production by European states during the 16th and 17th centuries, and as a consequence, 
the East Indies had first fallen largely under Portuguese control, and then the suzerainty of the Dutch Republic. While the Dutch colonial empire in places such as New Holland in North America and in South Africa would eventually collapse in the 17th and 18th centuries, the country's role in the East Indies continued well into the 20th century. Thus, when Michael Rockefeller arrived to Papa, the East Indies had only recently declared their independence as the Republic of Indonesia in 1945, after which a lengthy process occurred before the independence was recognised. Yet, Papa was still not part of independent Indonesia by the time that Rockefeller arrived, and the island continued to be administered by the Dutch government as Netherlands New Guinea. At the time, and indeed to this very day, the southwestern parts of New Guinea were inhabited by the Azmat people, an ethnic group consisting of tens of thousands of people, whose society by modern standards could be described as underdeveloped, but whose wood carving tradition was and still is highly praised. This is a land largely without stone and other malleable building material, so from early on the Azmat people developed a high proficiency in using wood for various purposes. Today, their pieces are sought out by collectors globally, and even by the early 1960s, the Azmat's artistic output was in high demand. This was one of the inspirations for the expedition that Rockefeller undertook to the region in conjunction with the Museum of Primitive Art. Michael's first expedition proved enormously exciting for the young student, and with a budding interest in the Azmat people and their culture, he quickly organised a second expedition, for later in 1961. This one specifically aimed at travelling more amongst the Azmat and obtaining some of their wood carved works. Yet, little did Michael know at the time that this second expedition would tragically lead to his disappearance. He set off with René Wassing, a 34 year old Dutch anthropologist who was assigned as a kind of government chaperone to accompany Michael and two locals. It was while on a day trip on the 18th of November 1961 that the expedition ran into trouble. Travelling by sea on a small motorboat, the group decided to take a more choppy sea route as a shortcut. However, the weather gradually became worse as the day wore on, and the party was soon in trouble. So much so, that the motor died on the boat, leaving them all stranded out at sea. Eventually, the wind pushed them close enough to the shore that the two locals with them stated that they were going to take their chances with swimming for safety. Rockefeller and Wazing elected to remain with the boat as they had dozens of Azmat wood-carved pieces on board and wished to save these. They believed they would soon be rescued once the locals made it back to civilization, but this decision soon proved disastrous. Shortly afterwards, the ship was blown over, scattering the Azmat woodwork into the sea and leaving Michael and the anthropologist clinging to the upturned boat. With things now desperate, at 8am the following morning, Michael turned to his colleague and said, I think I can make it, and set off to swim for shore. He was never seen again, nor was his body ever recovered. A young man just 23, he was childless at the time, having never married. So the question is, just what happened to Michael Rockefeller? Michael's disappearance quickly made international news headlines, a product of his family's wealth and prominence in American life. Yet despite an immediate investigation, his body was never found, nor any other evidence of exactly what had happened to him. Initially designated as a missing person, he was deemed in 1964 to have legally died on the 19th of November 1961. Yet, this was certainly not the end of the mystery of Michael Clark Rockefeller's disappearance. Several theories have emerged over the years. The simplest is that Rockefeller simply drowned before he made it back to shore. Wazing, who was rescued on the 20th of November, the day after Rockefeller tried to swim to shore, subsequently testified that they had been as much as 18 kilometers from the coast when Michael set off on his desperate swim. Most would probably drown if they tried to undertake a swim of this length, but Rockefeller 
was an accomplished athlete, one who could have travelled this far, particularly so if the tide was moving in his favour. Nevertheless, the possibility that he drowned remains the overwhelmingly most likely theory about what happened to him. However, more sinister theories have abounded. One of the more elaborate suppositions has argued that Rockefeller actually survived the event in November 1961 and reached the local Azmat people. There he went native, as it were, joining the local tribe and living amongst them as some sort of figure like Kurtz from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Yet, most have dismissed this theory as fantastical, not least because subsequent investigations have never revealed Rockefeller to have lived in the area. More plausible is the notion that Rockefeller did survive his epic swim and made it to the shore, but was then subsequently killed by the local Azmat people there. There is substantial reason to believe this may have been the case. Firstly, the local Azmat people engaged in cannibalism, and it is possible that they found Rockefeller near the coastline, presumably exhausted from his long swim, killed him and ate him. In fact, there is substantial evidence to suggest that a scenario like this might have played out. The locals certainly had a motive. In 1961, they were extremely angered about the European and American settlers nearby, as several of the local tribe near where Rockefeller would have come ashore had allegedly been killed by a Dutch patrol in 1958. Thus, it is entirely plausible that Rockefeller was killed in a revenge killing three years later. This theory was viewed with enough credibility that Michael's mother apparently hired a private investigator years later, in 1979, to look into it. This detective is alleged to have made contact with a local Azmat, who presented him with three skulls. The remains of what they claimed were the three white people they had killed over the years. The investigator was convinced enough that one of these could indeed have been the skull of Rockefeller, that he brought it back to New York and showed it to the family there. Further research suggests that the family might have paid the detective a quarter of a million dollars in return, perhaps indicating that the family had concluded at this point that Michael had in fact made it to the shore and been killed by the local Azmat. But the most systematic investigation yet was undertaken in 2014 when the author and journalist Carl Hoffman, a former editor with National Geographic and one with a particular expertise in New Guinea, published a book entitled Savage Harvest, a tale of cannibals, colonialism and Michael Rockefeller's tragic quest for primitive art. Here Hoffman concluded that Rockefeller did most likely make it ashore and was killed in retribution for the attack by the Dutch on the Azmat three years earlier in 1958. However, much of the evidence for this was destroyed shortly afterwards, when a cholera outbreak amongst the virally undefended Azmat resulted in the deaths of several of those who had been involved in the killing and eating of the young anthropologist. Hence, it seems likely that Michael Clark Rockefeller did indeed meet with a violent and dreadful end in New Guinea on the 19th of November 1961, having made it all the way to the coast from 18 kilometers out at sea. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the video and let me know down in the comments what you thought happened. If you survived, drowned, was eaten by the tribe and anything else. If you have any recommendations, be sure to leave them down in the comments or you can find my Instagram and email in the description and you can send them there. I hope you have notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as they're uploaded. And if you enjoyed, make sure to like and subscribe. Anyway, that's all from me. So I'll see all of you in the next unfortunate end. Thanks.